Okay, you want to talk about um, uh, this afternoon about keeping reserves, keeping reserves, because when we come to the Lord and get baptized and spirit filled, the Lord fills us up, as uh, you know, mentioned in testimony there about all these blessings the Lord has for us and provisions He makes, and uh, he, He's there. Uh, you know, he, he's, even, he's there not in capacity of just for today, but he's also in the capacity of he gives us all these reserves, reserves that uh, are really relevant to the day uh, when, if, if the Lord tarries, the day when we uh, uh, pass on, when we draw our last breath and we have reserves there that will take us through I- into eternity. And uh, what really, uh, um, you know, I suppose, think about what to talk about and praying about it and everything and uh, one thing we've probably all been watching this week has been the uh, 12 young schoolboys and uh, their 25-year-old teacher uh, trapped in the cave over in Thailand there. And uh, they were there for, what, eight, nine days uh, before they were discovered, before they were found. And uh, I remember thinking at the time, I thought, you know, probably what a lot of us were thinking, I hope they took quite a bit of food with them. And uh, uh, it turned out uh, whatever food they would have taken obviously wouldn't have been enough. And uh, talks about the uh, uh, the teacher there. He shared all his food uh, uh, with his with his with his amongst his students, and uh, uh, he's very uh, he's struggling with health himself to get back. Even though the food's there now, they've got to build up their their strength and everything for for the rescue effort, which hasn't taken place yet. And uh, you know, it's a terrible ordeal. And you think, well, they went there just to have a look in this cave system and suddenly there was a, a downpour of rain uh, as, and uh, uh, they're, they're in a trap situation. And throughout history, there's been many situations where people get caught at. And uh, uh, being at, uh, you know, I like boating as most people know and uh, fishing, uh, probably boating more than fishing because, yeah, anyway, it's another story. But uh, the, uh, you know, over, over the time, there's a, a lot of guys get caught out, out to sea. I was reading some statistics many years ago because uh, I belong to a, um, you know, pay a subscription to the uh, VMR on the Gold Coast here. They helped me out when I was younger and, you know, had uh, dodgy engines that broke down and all these sort of things. Ronnie remembers pretty well. And, uh, and uh, you got a call, call somebody, you would call out VMR and they would bring their boat out and rescue you. So uh, I... Uh, Anyway, you, you, uh, I've read sometimes where they talk about the uh, number of people that they have to uh, rescue and uh, the predominant one is running out of fuel. That is the predominant rescue situation that guys go to sea and they run out of fuel. And uh, you might think, well, I'm going to go from A to B, I'm going to go out to the 24 fathoms or the 30 fathoms or the 50 fathoms, whatever it is. I'm going to go out through the seaway and go down and I'll go down to maybe uh, Burley there and fish around and come back or down to Palm Beach Reef. And people work out and they say, yeah, I know how far my boat will travel on so many litres of fuel. So they work it out and they think, yeah, I've got plenty of fuel. And uh, what happens when you're on the way back, uh, then there's wind and then there's... Uh, gullies and hills and uh, uh, in the sea, white, white, we call it, um, you know, white caps. And suddenly your boat uh, has got a lot of pressure against it that uh, you've got to use more acceleration, more fuel to keep it going, uh, to keep uh, slogging away. And uh, they reckon that's where most people make the mistake that when the going gets tough, they haven't got the reserves there. They've allowed for calm, for calm sea there and calm sea back. And uh, when they're slogging it out through the heavy stuff, uh, they find they haven't got the reserves and they run out of fuel. And uh, you know, leave the say, uh, there's one thing, uh, you know, I've got, uh, I always fill the boat up, even if I'm going out and I know I'm only going to use 20 litres of fuel, I'll make sure it's full before I go, because you never know what could happen. I remember reading uh, one day in, in, in the news, there was a guy who was fishing in the uh, Tweed River, the Tweed River, just fishing in a small boat, and his anchor, his anchor rope snapped or something happened, they lost their anchor, and he ended up drifting, and they drifted through the uh, uh, through the bar, over the bar there at Tweed, and uh, had to sea, and uh, had to be rescued. You think, well, you know, what were your chances of that happening? Pretty rare, aren't they? But uh, what things can go things can go wrong, and uh, it's when the things you know when things happen extraordinarily, it's good to have those reserves, even though no reserves will last, of course, forever. That uh, except for the spiritual reserves the Lord gives us, uh, they are there forever. So uh, it's the unexpected chain of events that you're reserved for. 
Um, I looked up, uh, what is it, uh, reserved means to, uh, you know, something which is uh, retained for the future. And I made a note, something for, you heard about it? It's for a rainy day? For a rainy day? I grew up in England, I was born in 1953, for those who, you know, may not want to know what time. And um, the reason I mention that is because um, there was a lot, lot, everybody sort of talked about the war years. And then, and then you talk to your grandparents and they would be talking about things called the, uh, uh, the depression, the uh, depressions of the, I think it was the 1920s. And, and they were really, they never trusted the banks, they never trusted, you know, they, they wanted to, um, uh, you know, they, they'd have probably hide a bit of money under the mattress or in the backyard in a tin or something for, for when they run out of money. And, uh, uh, and, and they were so cautious, so conscious of, uh, of preparing for the future because they'd been through the depression and uh, uh, time when people lost houses, lost their jobs first and, and then lost their houses and lost their, you know, no furniture. And uh, it was a pretty horrific time uh, for a lot of the, uh, the uh, established world at the time. And uh, anybody who went through that, they, were, they, they never forgot it for the rest of their lives. And, uh, yeah, there were stories we were told growing up as kids and it was fresh in people's mind. And World War II was fresh in people's mind and uh, they were very conscious of, uh, of having reserves. I remember mum used to always, the, the, the food, the, ca- the pantry, you know, she, she'd you know, pack it full of food and everything because you know, we could run out, there could be this or that happen or that happen and I never understood it as a kid. And uh, yes, well, luckily she was able to do that. But anyway, the thing is that um, you know, people who, who want to be prepared for the future, they want to have something for a rainy, for a rainy day for the unexpected time. So let's have a look in Matthew 25. Matthew 25. And we'll take it up in uh, some well-known scripture here in, uh, in uh, Matthew 25, verse 1. And then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And uh, the five of them which uh, were wise, and five of them were wise, or the word wise means they're prudent, they were mindful, they were cautious, and, and uh, you know that they wanted to be well prepared. And five of them were foolish; uh, they just didn't see the importance of uh, going the extra mile. And it says in verse three, and they that were foolish, t- they that were foolish, um, took their lamps. And they took no oil with them. So, in other words, they took their lamps, but the only oil was what was in their lamp. But they took no other oil with them. It's like uh, going out in your boat and you've got an X number of litres and a 60 litre tank or whatever. And uh, if you're Craig Nikeel and you go in the back of Burke or whatever with your boat, you take all these jerry cans of fuel, which, all, which I don't know how he does it. And uh, so he's got enough fuel to get back. Well, uh, they, they had enough oil in their lamp and uh, uh, they didn't worry about taking any jerry cans of oil with them. And it says here, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So they were going to make sure that they didn't run out. They were going to make sure that they had plenty of reserves to get them through. Because uh, they, they didn't know what lay ahead. And uh, they, were, they were going to be on their guard. And it says in verse 5, and, but while, uh, it says, while the bridegroom tarried or lingered, and it's a little bit like that now, we're, we're expecting the Lord to return, and, uh, um, but no man knows the day, the time of the hour. You know, not even the angels know, but God knows. And, uh, and, uh, but we see the seasons, we see the times, and we see it, it, it appears to be drawing close, but you've only got to be uh, 100 years out, and it's a, a big difference. But uh, the thing is that uh, it, it almost, you know, you say, well, the Lord's lingering, the Lord's tarrying or whatever. And uh, things uh, takes a bit longer. When I came to the Lord in 1979, there were people who were talking about the Lord returning in the next 10 years. There were t- people talking about, a lot of folk in the assembly were, were convinced the Lord was returning before or at the year 2000. And I, I, I sort of never had that conviction in myself that I sort of felt that. I thought, oh, it'd be nice if he does, but and uh, nice for us, not nice for the world, but... Uh, uh, you know, it's, you, 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 at the end of the day, you really don't know. And if you had your heart set on the fact the Lord was returning by the year 2000 and suddenly 2005 comes along and so on and so on, you, 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 you're sort of, 
you know, the journey's a lot longer than what you may have originally considered. I think it's good to live your life. Uh, when I came to the Lord, I decided, you know, we've got to live our lives spiritually as though the Lord's returning today, tomorrow, and we've got to, live, uh, we've got to plan materially and live our lives in, in a material sense, providing for our, uh, you know, for our families, for our children and, and that sort of thing. We've got to live them as though the Lord may, uh, may not come back for 100 years or more. And if you uh, have that in your mind, well, you know, sort of, uh, you know, we can be prepared for the long run. And it says here that um, at midnight there was a, a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom uh, cometh. Uh, go you out to meet him. Suddenly, uh, at midnight. You ever fallen asleep? Then been woken up at midnight? I remember going up with Craig. We were going fishing at 1770 one day, out from 1770, and... And uh, it was getting so, it was getting, you know, the, we were travelling through the night and we got to uh, the highway where you turn off to 1770 and we were both dead beat. And uh, we decided to pull over and just to go to sleep for, a, I think it was an hour or an hour and a half or whatever. And I just went out like a light. All I can remember is going out like a light. And next minute I know Craig saying, OK, wake up, we've got to go, we've got to go. And I, I'm forcing myself to wake up there and... Uh, you know, I said, and I'm going to Craig, I don't know how you can drive. I was that, I felt that crook, only having an hour's sleep or whatever, and then having to wake up, and I'm thinking, I'm glad he's driving, because I couldn't drive. You know, I was that, uh, it's a, probably one of the few times in my life where I felt that way, but I was, somebody woken me up out of a deep sleep, and I was good for nothing. It wasn't until we got to the boat ramp and that was uh, probably two and a half hours later that I was actually starting to sort of come awake. It was, uh, so I can, I think maybe this, uh, this situation, suddenly when you least expect it, there's a cry, there's a cry made. The Lord's, the Lord's here. And uh, in verse 7, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps or put them in order, or, order got organized. And uh, the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. And the word in the margin of my KJV, it says, gone out or going out. So they could see, wow, we're in trouble here. We haven't got enough to, uh, to uh, go the distance. And it says, but the wise answered, saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy, for you, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. A little bit like the door on the ark we spoke of on Wednesday night. And afterwards came also the uh, uh, other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know, I know you not. And it goes on, it says in verse 13, Watch you therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. No, nobody knows the time. Therefore, have the reserves. Be on guard. And you know, every time we pray, you know, maybe sometimes you might pray and you have a real fuzzy feeling and everything. Wow, I've got a lot real buzz out of that. Other times you might think, well, okay, I just had half an hour of prayer, an hour of prayer, or whatever, and praying in the spirit, praying in tongues. Think, well, I, I don't feel any different. You know, did, did I get much out of that? But the Bible says that when we pray. It's a real delight to the Lord. The Lord delights in the prayer of his saints. And uh, I look upon it as though when we're praying, we're building up reserves. We're storing up reserves for, you know, for a rainy day against the future. We come to a meeting and it's all you know, building up our reserves. Somebody uh, many years ago talked about uh, that coming to a meeting was like going to, to the oasis to top up your tank sort of thing, that you sort of run, run, run dry when you're out there in the world and you, and you come to a meeting and it sort of tops you up to get through the week and so on. And uh, it really, you've got to go somewhere to replenish your reserves. And uh, there's so much we do in the Lord that really replenishes the reserves, keeps the reserves topped up. We used to, uh, I remember, you, you ever, or you ever, you ever done a trip to the northern side of Brisbane? You know, you go over the gateway and you're on the north side of Brisbane and you're heading up to the sunny coast. Your people actually live up there. And um, you go to the sunny coast and you know, these days it's always a traffic jam. You know, this, you, want, you hit the north side and you go, this is, this is crazy. And years ago, there used to be, used to drive along, uh, heading towards the sunny coast, and there'd be bottles of water. Anybody remember that? 
Yeah, tied, tied to lampposts and tied to, on the way up. Some guy had it, it was in the, on the news, and on the pa- in the paper about it at one stage, that some guy had it in his mind, you know, that people would, would run out of water in their cars and they want water. So he used to put a two litres of water, whatever it was, uh, they'd be tied to a, a lamppost. And people uh, were making the comments that that really got me out of trouble. This guy wanted reserves there for people so that they could finish their journey. That's pretty being pretty conscientious of uh, other people, eh? Not just the self. Yeah, I, I don't think it happens these days. I, I don't know. But uh, they still ha- still there? Russell, they still there, the bottles of water hanging? No, no, I don't think so. Okay. It's just all road works now. Okay. All right, let's have a look at uh, Luke 14. Luke 14. Luke 14 and uh, verse, uh, verse uh, 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, This is Jesus, If any man come to me and hate not, the word there is, is uh, love less by comparison. You can research it yourself. If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, uh, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciples. In other words, uh, if you're going to love the Lord and say, I love the Lord, you've got to have a change of priorities in your life. You've got to say, well, okay, the Lord comes first. And that's something which a lot of people find hard to do is to change the priorities. And here's what Jesus is saying. You know, if you want to be my disciple, he said, you've got to change your priorities. You've got to put the Lord first, put Jesus first. And in verse 27, and whosoever does not bear his cross or take up his responsibility or do what's required of him and so on, it says, and come after me cannot be my disciple cannot be my disciple. I know when I came along and I thought I got baptized and received the Holy Spirit, and oh, it's great, wonderful, and all the rest of it, I thought, <laughs> oh, I thought that's it. You know, somebody came and said, you want to bring a talk? I said, no. You know, I don't want to do anything. I'm here, just waiting for the Lord to return now. Whoa. You know, uh, yes, I had a few, I got spoken to a few times anyway, encouraged and all the rest of it. And uh, the thing is, in, an, in a good way, and uh, you know, we all tend to think, well, this is it, I've arrived. I, I exist. So because I exist, that's the end of it. But there's a, there's a Jesus is talking about here, but there's more than just existing. There's more than just being baptized and spirit-filled. You've also, we've also got to take up and bear our responsibility. Think about it, if nobody bore, bore their responsibility. You ever think about it? If nobody bore their responsibility, there wouldn't be a building to meet in. There wouldn't be uh, supplies in the kitchen. You know, if nobody wanted to wash and dry the dishes after the, uh, you know, time of fellowship, well, the kitchen would be a write-off. Uh, and so it goes on, you know. Anyway, all right, you can, you can think about the rest. Okay, it says here that, um, so it says, And whosoever does not bear his cross, come after me, cannot be my, my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? So there's one thing to start something, but to finish it. People, people are looking for the finished product. People are looking to see, this is what you're on about. This is what you've built, and so on. It says here in verse 29, Lest happily, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able or strong enough or didn't have the reserves enough to finish it. You haven't, got to go, you haven't got to go far in any city you live in, and somewhere, if you look around, you will find a house that was never completed. We go to Fraser Island once in a blue moon, and uh, uh, over in Fraser Island there, suddenly you'll be driving down this sandy track, and you'll come, al- come across a slab. Sometimes a slab's got a, a, a half of a frame. And, and you, you go, and look at it, and you go, what a waste. Somebody's gone to all that effort to lay a slab on Fraser Island. That, that's major. That's major work to lay a slab on Fraser Island. I mean, concrete 
cement, you've got to bring stuff over and all this, and then you've got to bring the timber over for the slab and all the rest of it, or metal, if there's a metal frame uh, to, to build on the slab. And, uh, you know, somebody's gone to all that effort and then stopped. And you know why they stopped? Anybody know? Ran out of reserves. Ran out of money. Ran out of money. Look, I want to ask you a question. Think, I don't want anybody to put their hand up or anything, but it's just, why don't you think about it for a moment? If tomorrow your job came to an end, if tomorrow the banks closed down, if tomorrow the telling machines did stop working, how long would you survive? What reserves have you got, you and I got? Most people, the reserves are the credit cards, eh? I got plastic. I'll, I'll float. Yes, what if the plastic doesn't work? In the Depression years that uh, uh, people have money in the banks and suddenly uh, the banks went uh, belly up. If you don't know what that means, they went broke. <laughs> you know, especially in America, there was a lot of it. People just, that's why people wouldn't trust the banks because banks went broke. Uh, suddenly they couldn't get their money. The doors were shut and, uh, uh, and so on. The thing is that, you know, most people today, uh, generally speaking, there's not a lot of reserves there. Most of, most of us, we're, we're living week to week or month to month or whatever. And uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, what, what would it be like after maybe uh, a month, two months? Kids keep eating. You know? Yeah. Think, well, I'll pray and fast for a week. You know? You'll get hungry eventually. So, see the point? But, you know, with having the Lord there, the Lord, pro the Lord provides in really in miraculous ways. I remember years ago, um, sometimes there are reserves there that, in the Lord that you don't realize you've got. You ever found that? The reserve, you find suddenly there are reserves. I remember Sandy and I, we went through a really tough time. When we first came to the Lord and, uh, you know, really, really tough. And we, uh, you know, uh, money run out and, uh, and uh, I, we, we'd, uh, we're in a rented house and uh, had to pay the rent. So I uh, gathered all the furniture and every, everything I could, could think that we, uh, we could get away with uh, not using. And uh, I took it all to the... Uh, uh, second hand place and whatever wherever I could and you know sold it and um, that got us through for a while and then we hit this we hit this really low point again and uh, I'm going oh no we can't pay the rent this week this is bad this is really it's really the pits and uh, I'm going to say any I don't know I don't know how we're going to get a, get around this we got no money to pay the rent it was really really tough we had just enough money to sort of put food on the table and we both prayed about it and uh, uh, that afternoon it went down and there was a, uh, a letter in the letterbox and it was from, I think, AGC or I think, I think it was a, the finance company at the time and it was a cheque for like $110, which is what the rent was for that week. That's genuine. That's not exaggerated. That's not pretense. That's not expanded on. That's the way it worked. We had prayer. The letter was there. The check was there. Dear Mr. Coles, you overpaid when you uh, uh, paid out a car some time back. It was a year ago or whatever, six months ago or whatever. We just got out of this car by the, the skin of our teeth. And uh, uh, well, somewhere in the transaction and everything, it got overpaid by $110. We had prayer that day and the check was there. And from there on, everything started to pick up from then on. That was a really low point. That's probably what sticks in my mind so much. But it taught us the Lord answers prayer. Amen? So there you are. Sometimes you find, and I heard a similar testimony only recently. Somebody said something very similar along the same lines. And uh, it just makes you realize the Lord, he, he's conscious of what we need. He says that in his scripture. And he, he says that he'll care for us. He'll go before us. He'll provide in ways that are far beyond our natural understanding. And you'll find uh, there will be times in your life, uh, even in the Lord, when you really have a need and you'll start, that's when you'll call out to the Lord and the Lord will come through with reserves that you never knew were there. Praise the Lord. Proverbs uh, 25. You might think, well, this is a bit of a, you know, diversion from the having reserves, but you see where I go. 
Okay, Proverbs 25 and uh, just one verse here, verse 8. It says, go not forth hastily to strive. Now, strive means argue, get into a heated debate with, fight, quarrel. Go not forth hastily, don't rush in to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbour has put thee to shame. And all I can think, wow, I've, I've done that, you know. It's human nature. It's human nature to rush in, to rush in, to strive over something, to strive with somebody over a situation. I've got to take you to task over this. You've got a little bit of information and we run with it. Anybody ever done that? I know I've done it, you know. I think, oh, well, I'll make sure I never do that again. You, you, you know, if you ever watch any of these crime shows, police shows and all the rest of it, you know, whatever, you find uh, uh, the police, they're out there, uh, whether it's a cold case or whatever, they're out there gathering all their information and all the rest of it, and there's the crook there, you know, uh, the crooks are there, they're, they're, uh, they're happily doing their, doing their thing, thinking, oh, it's great, you know, we robbed the bank, we did this, we did that, they think they got away with it, and there are the police working behind the scenes, and they're getting all their information, aren't they? Getting all the reserves, that when finally they knock on the door, and they say to the crook, we caught you. You robbed the bank. We know you did it. And it's not because somebody told them. It's not, it's not because uh, a hearsay information. It's because they've gone further and they've got all their reserves and they go there and they want to know that, uh, that the charges they lay, those charges will stick. And it's a little bit like that with, uh, with uh, you and I. You know, somebody... Uh, we find something goes against us or whatever, it doesn't go, th- and we want to we you know, sort it all out and everything. It just make sure you get your facts straight. The Bible says we'll hear one side of the story and we'll go, wow, let me at it. You know, I've got to sort that out. And it says then the neighbor will come and reprove it. You hear the neighbor's side and you go, oh, that's different to the other story I heard. And that's, that's life. That's life. And, and that's what the Scripture's talking about. Don't be hasty to strive to argue, to debate. It says, for, you know, um, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof uh, when thy neighbour has put thee to shame. When you end up with egg on your face. Hey, I've been there. Oh, why did I open my big mouth? Why didn't I just keep quiet? Why didn't I get my facts right in the first place? You know, your heart sinks and all the rest of it. Oh, so, you know, as we get older, uh, you know, hindsight's a great teacher and we end, up, we end up learning, we end up learning. I think I'll, 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 I'll just take a deep breath for a moment and just find out a bit more about this. If, if, if we all did this as people in life, there'd be a lot less tr- troubles, a lot less problems between husbands and wives and parents and kids and kids and parents and all, you name it. It goes on all, all the way through. So, you know... Make sure you've got the reserves there. If you're going to go into battle, if you're going to go into to, to a war situation, you've got to make sure you've got reserves there. It's no use stretching your supply. It's no use running out and saying, I'm going to fight that war, and it's uh, you know, 500 kilometres away, and you, you, you've got all the, res- all, all the provisions to get there, but you've got no, uh, no, no weapons with you, no reserves. No, no, you hadn't thought about taking some water with you to get a drink when you get thirsty or food when you get hungry. Uh, just going to go and do battle, you know. Make sure you've got the reserves there. Make sure that when you go to confront the enemy or whatever, the situation, that you know, you've got all the reserves there to, that you get it right, that you, you come out a winner. All right. Um, okay, into, uh, over to Proverbs 14. We'll finish up shortly. Proverbs 14. And verse 12. It says here, there is a way that which seemeth right or just unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's nothing worse than going down the wrong path. You ever, go, you know, you go down the road, you go, you're in a strange area and you're driving around, you're looking for somewhere and everything, and you come to a road and it says, dead end. Or it says, no through road. So what do you do? Especially when the GPS is saying, go down that road. 
people, people have done that, follow that GPS has got to be right. People end up in the drink, ended up in a pond or a lake or <laughs> following their GPS, which has to be right, and the GPS wasn't up to date. You know? But, you know, you see a sign, no through road or dead end. Well, why? Oh, I just want you to think about it. Why has somebody put it there, do you think? Why has somebody put that sign there? To save you and I a lot of wasted energy? To save our time? To save going all the way down there, getting to the dead end and having to turn around and come back at, at, to, to that point where we departed off the track. In other words, not every road is going to get you to your destination. And there are plenty of roads that uh, where God has said, uh, the Bible says, don't go down this track, it's a dead end. God knows what's the best track to follow, what the best pathway is to follow. He says his way is straight and it's narrow. And it says, you know, that, it, that it'll get you to your destination. But then there's other roads and it says dead end, no through road. And people say, well, I'm going to try and get through here. Well, good luck. You know, you end up turning around, come back and all the rest of it. And, uh, you know, every, every way seems right to a man. I think I can get through there. i got a four-wheel drive. I can knock over the fence and this, 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 this. I can do this. And do uh, you find out, oh, I, I can't do that. And everything, it always seems right to a man there, but the way, you know, it's not necessarily going to lead to the, the place you want to get to. All right. You know, I made a note here that, um, that uh, not every way seems right. Right, uh, Not all roads will get you to your destination. You need guidance. And somebody said, look, you do this, 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 you know, and you'll get to that destination you're after. So you need guidance. The Bible gives you guidance. You need uh, ability. So you need means of transport. And the Lord gives us a means of transport. He, he provides our, he may, turns our body into the temple of God. He puts a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside us. And we've got our means of transport spiritually. We need um, provisions along the way. Provisions to, to complete the journey. And, and the Lord furnishes the table. The Bible talks about he can furnish a table even in the wilderness. And, uh, of course, the other thing when you're on a journey and when you're travelling to a destination, it's good if you can see. It's good if you've got, you know, got vision. The worst, the worst thing is, growing up in England and uh, mum and dad used to do travelling back and forth and, and uh, you know, sometimes we'd be travelling in a blizzard, I mean snow blizzard. It was hopeless. You, you, you're lucky to see beyond the bonnet. In a snow in a snowstorm, I remember we got uh, we we were on this road. It was like a big highway, two lanes either way, and uh, uh, we, we were travelling along. And it, the 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 road got narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower in t- until the until the moment that the car got wedged. I don't know why Dad did it, but anyway, the car got wedged on this highway, and we couldn't go anywhere in the middle of a snowstorm. I know you guys, you know people. Oh, I would love to see the snow. I've seen plenty of snow in my <clears throat> first 12 years of life. Anyway, and we were freezing in the car. Luckily, a farmer came along with us with a tractor and dragged us out, took us to his home, and, uh, uh, and we survived. Because a lot of people died. People would die in that situation in, in England, in, in real life. You know? But uh, you, you want to be able to see where you're going. You want to be able to look ahead. The other thing is fog. I remember being in Toowoomba one day, and there was fog. I mean... Uh, I remember fog in England, but not fog in Australia. Give us a break. And when, you got, when there's fog and you haven't got fog lamps, you know, they're coloured light, lights that help you a little bit. Anyway, it, it, it's really hard to, to proceed. So you need to be able to see where, you, where you're going. And the Lord gives us spiritual eyes. He gives us a vision that we can see this is, we can see clearly where to go. And uh, it's our choice. We can go down the dead ends and the no-through roads and all the rest of it. The Lord will let us do whatever we want. But if we want to do it His way, we'll, we'll, go the, through the, uh, we'll follow His direction and we'll use the vision that He gives us. Praise the Lord. Okay, over to um, uh, Mark 16. Mark 16. Mark 16.
He said here in verse 15, And Jesus said unto his, unto his disciples, you Go you into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to every creature or every nation. He that believes, of course not everybody's going to believe, he that believes and then does something is baptised, he said, shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. And then he said, and these signs shall follow. All these provisions will follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils or Satan's cause to go out of people's lives. They'll speak with new tongues. And it says they'll uh, take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. What a great provision, eh? What a great reserve to have that in times of sickness you can call upon the Lord. And after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. That's where Jesus is now on the right hand of God. And he's still doing in verse 20, is still relevant. And they went forth and preached everywhere on their journey, the Lord, the Lord working with them from the right hand of God, confirming the word with signs following. Confirming the word, reassuring, you know, adding to uh, and so on. And that, that's how the Lord works with us. Over to uh, 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1. In verse, uh, verse 3, according as his divine power, the Lord has given us all things, given us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness. He's given us all things, even things that we cannot see, all things that pertain that are relevant unto life and to godliness, to lead a godly life. And it says, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And then it says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That's what you and I got when we got baptized and we got filled with the Holy Ghost. We were given at that moment exceeding great and precious promises that it will be there all our lives. It says, uh, great and precious promises that by these, by these reserves, by these things the Lord gives us, that by these you might be partakers of the godly powers, having escaped the corruption that is in the wor world through lust. And we'll finish up in uh, 2 Timothy and chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, in verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. The Lord's the final judge. Preach the word. Uh, it says, be instant in season and out of season. The word instant there is be constant and be stable. And, and that's the way we run into trouble sometimes. Be stable, uh, constant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort or encourage with all long suffering and doctrine. Go the distance. It says here, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine or healthy doctrine, but after their own ideas, their own desires, their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth, the, the word of God. Turn away their ears from the truth and will be turned under fables or imaginations. It says, but watch thou in all things. Be alert, be sober, be like the wise ones who took the spare supply with them. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. It says, make full proof of thy ministry. Do what you've got to do. It says, for I am now, Paul said, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. He said, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to leave. He said, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. And he said, henceforth there is laid up for me. And this is something he was identifying here, that beyond his life, beyond death, beyond the grave, he said, I've got provisions, he said, I've got reserves. And that's something all of us have got. We've got reserves way beyond the reserves of this life. He said here, I, finished, I fought a good fight, finished my course, kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That's the greatest reserve of all. Praise the Lord. Back to Pastor John.